to all of our guests, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Hi everyone, my name's Nicole and I'll be hosting the webinar for you today. Thanks so much for joining our Microsoft Azure experts, Mark Lomas and David Cox for the second event in this Azure webinar series. So October is Programs Exploring Azure Cloud Webinar Month and today's webinar topic is Modern Workplace and Azure Virtual Desktop. This Microsoft-led session explores end-user computing for the modern hybrid workforce and questions, does your organisation view work as something we do or somewhere we go? Today's presenters will explain how a simple path for transitioning to a more modern, agile and secure way of working is achieved with Azure Virtual Desktop. For those organisations interested in achieving a modern, agile and secure way of working, Mark and David's session focuses on how to save money with no additional license costs, managing your hybrid workforce and how cloud desktop can play to BDI. Before we start, I'd like to let you know that if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to write them down in the Q&A tab at the top right corner and we'll answer them after the presentation. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our two speakers today, Mark Lomas and David Cox, both of whom are seasoned Microsoft Azure experts so I'll hand you over now to David Cox, who'll start us off with our Modern Workplace and Azure Virtual Desktop Webinar. Over to you, Dave. Thank you, Nicole. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're well, and thank you for joining us again. I will just share my slides and we'll make a start. Fantastic, off we go. So yes, uh, today we're going to be looking at this uh, new opportunity, uh, how we're addressing uh, hybrid working, what challenges and opportunities does it present for our organisations. Uh, and I'm going to be uh, giving you a tour of the Azure Virtual Desktop Microsoft solution. Um, we've worked closely with uh, Proband on this for a number of years now, um, particularly during lockdown, there was huge momentum around this particular product. Uh, and you're probably looking at at it at a good time because the uh, you know the user interface the the, the features uh, have improved so much over the last few years uh, i saw it i first saw it in dublin in its private preview and uh, it it was in a very different state to what it's in now um which is great we're seeing microsoft are putting a huge amount of money into uh continued innovation uh for avd part of the reason is because um, hybrid working wasn't just, uh, you know, a, a necessity uh, during COVID. You, you had those people with their hot takes saying it was a bit of a fad and everything would go back to normal afterwards. But we haven't seen that in most industries, at least. Um, and uh, this is probably more a more relatable scenario that, that people can relate to. Uh, we're just in a very different space where now uh, our devices uh, essentially now the, the end point. Uh, we might be juggling kids and trying to keep the uh, the dinner from burning downstairs. And we got the young ones, play, you know, playing doodle jump on a work phone. You know, have, have we got our applications like Outlook and Teams? Have they got MFA and all this on it? And look, I'm, I'm being, a, I'm poking fun here. I'm, I'm not <laughs> for a moment suggesting a, a three year old's going to somehow accidentally stumble into the wrong Outlook email and, you know, send the wrong email. I just mean we we got to have things locked down and, and sensible. Um, and it becomes a challenge. And and for those of you that were here last week, um, hopefully one of the uh, things that perhaps resonated with you, I was saying that I feel like this, the advent of hybrid working is a, a big quality of life improvement for us as like everyday people, but it's a, a, a bit of a logistical uh, and security nightmare, uh, you know, for IT managers, there's, there's a lot more, um, points of failure and things that are going to keep us up at night. And so what what we discussed briefly again last week was trying to reduce the uh, the opportunities for user error as much as we can. And, and this particular solution uh, is a great sort of belts and braces approach for that. So we'll get into that. <clears throat> and I think here are probably some of the challenges you've either you're either facing now or, or probably certainly were facing during the lockdown, at least. Um, we want to make sure employees are still productive while working from home, which I think for, for some people was a, a big challenge. Uh, we need to think about how those users are connecting uh, and make sure that it's securely. We also need to think about uh, budget and cash flow. 
um, I know back then there were customers that, you know, they'd just done invested in a large hardware refresh and suddenly found themselves at home and realized that um, they essentially had to double up on some of their uh, expenditure. They might have had to resort to using more SaaS based products um, or perhaps some of the that they had some sort of on site desktops for CAD workers or something. Perhaps it wasn't realistic to ship those out to users. They perhaps didn't have a large dedicated space at home. And suddenly you were having to think about whether it's virtual desktops or uh, smaller, more portable devices. It likely came with further cost. And as I touched on first, we've got our data and security headaches to contend with as well. So there's, uh, there's a lot to think about. Um, and we want to control those costs as best we can. Uh, we want to really make sure that workers can access data wherever they are. If people are back on the road, um, checking their apps with their phone, we want to make sure that, that the experience is as close to using a, a fully fledged like desktop as possible, which again, we can do with Azure Virtual Desktop. We also want to make sure that things are ring fenced from bad actors. Uh, in, in our third session, Mark and I will be looking at Kind of cybersecurity in, in more focus. But unfortunately, um, there's been a huge uptick in um, you know attempted attack since the, the start of the pandemic. And a lot of these bad actors are opportunistic. So they will they their perception is that a smaller business won't have um, either the budget or perhaps the priority uh, where money's being focused for security. So we do have to make sure that's something that we're kind of sandbagging. And ultimately, we just want to streamline stuff, make it less of a headache for you. And that's where this comes in. So really, Microsoft have delivered two different solutions. There is a cloud PC or cloud desktop option, and there's a VDI option. And I'm going to break down both of those for you today. And I suppose for you, before we look at the feature sets of both of your routes, we need to think about maybe broader organizational organizational considerations. So um, what's your preference? Do you want a uh, something that's um, license based? Whether it's the most economical option or not, that may be uh, a moot point for you. You might prefer the um, as close to a static cost as you can possibly get, or you might like the idea of something that's consumption based, working closely with the team at Proban to um, put some scheduling in place so that you're economizing where possible to reduce cost. But you're also acknowledging that there may be some months where either user activity or because of the number of days in the month, you know, February versus a 31 day month, you're going to have variance in cost. So we need to you need to think about what your appetite is for that. Probably also think about um, how much kind of latent capacity do you have within your own IT teams? I appreciate uh, hopefully a lot of this will be done by the good team at ProBrand, but that's that's going to be a large part of what's being delivered to you, but there will be things and elements that need to be maintained your side. Um, so we need to think about like, um, yeah, how much latent capacity is there for that? Um, if we don't have much um, resourcing or, or team to, to dedicate to things like this, perhaps something like Windows 365, the more out of the box, more out of the box solution might be um, of more interest. But if you're trying to maximize costs and you want to muck in and get involved with the team, then Azure Virtual Desktop is going to give you um, a lot more opportunity to do both of those things. So looking at them uh, side by side, uh, Windows 365 is Microsoft's. Uh, it's actually it came out. I think it was Ignite last year. They announced this. So it really Windows 365 is Azure Virtual Desktop. It's built on the same platform. Uh, but with Windows 365, you pay a per user uh, monthly license cost. So it's a bit like buying a Microsoft 365 license. You pay uh, a static cost per month. And there's lots of different options, but they're all to do with the specification of the user desktop. So it will be the cores and RAM, uh, the attached storage um, and things like that. So it's all predefined. And in some ways, that's good because it, uh, it it's a way that Microsoft can deliver you a, a a per user dedicated desktop cost that is basically static. But for Microsoft to have been able to do that, they've had to have there's lots of predefined boxes that are ticked and you can't make any changes. So, for instance, the the session hosts 
uh, that power those desktops are always D-series virtual machines, which are decent. Uh, they're great for all sorts of general use workloads, but they aren't suited to everything. If you had CAD workers, if you had people doing 3D modeling, graphic design, you know, whatever, uh, they would do well with a dedicated GPU with a, uh, a graphics card and, and things like that, perhaps an N-series VM, uh, and you're not going to be able to do that with Windows 365. Whereas with Azure Virtual Desktop, you would have the opportunity to have three or four users uh, on that N-series box and the rest of your back office and other staff could use uh, maybe D-series virtual machines. And that means overall it's going to be quite cost efficient for you. Um, so that's one of the differences there. Um, yes, Windows 365 on the left does give us predictable per user pricing, but like I've just outlined there, you might have a use case for your workforce where it's not viable for some of your users. Um, or uh, perhaps if we look at the other side from a different angle, um, you might want to use the remote app streaming features that's um, a relatively new addition to AVD. It's been part of the solution for about nine months, so you can do multi-session desktops or you can look at app streaming. Um, and you can also bring um, additional solutions to the party. If, if you've already invested in Citrix and want to bring that, you can, um, or VMware. But again, you do that with Azure Virtual Desktop rather than Windows 365. So maybe a final point on the comparisons. Think of Windows 365 as, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but as a watered down version of AVD, and it's intentionally watered down so that you are offered a monthly license sort of software cost, I guess I'll call it. I guess we split it out a little differently here. And one thing you see is Windows 365 has two options. You've got business and enterprise, and it, and it kind of mirrors generally how Microsoft do their licensing, where the business option will be up to 300 seats, enterprise will be 300 plus. But what is a little, a bit of a departure, I think, to the um, general this differences between business and enterprise, is really if you have a scenario where you would want wider connectivity to a broader Azure environment. So what I mean by that is if you're going to have a cloud-based domain controller or an app server, or really if your users are going to be using anything that isn't browser-based, yeah, their applications, um, you would have to use Windows 365 Enterprise. Uh, business doesn't have wider connectivity. Um, I've always, I've always, it's always struck me as a bit odd because it seems a bit redundant in that case. Uh, if I look at um, opportunities we've worked on over the last year or so since it's been released, haven't sold a single business seat because m almost all organisations, it's not going to suit their needs. I could, uh, the only way I could think of it is if you were, if you were um, a, new, uh, a newer business, a newer kid on the block and um, born in the cloud, you had maybe Active Directory domain services and didn't have legacy apps that needed certificate services and all of that yes you could probably make do with the business version but most of you on the call here you'd be looking at enterprise which is more expensive so you might go okay dave well, where's the use case then for windows 365 and i feel like it's for uh if you have your users on an rds deployment and you're relatively um modest sized business maybe i don't know 10 to 20 users or something uh, the the economies of scale aren't really in your favour for RDS. If we think about the per user cost, that's going to be quite a lot, and that's where I've seen people look at Windows 365. They're, they're forking out for the enterprise version, which is um, relatively dear per user. But you get what I'm saying here. If the user base is small and you're currently using RDS, it could be a good fit. But really, the focus of today, I want to talk about Azure Virtual Desktop. Um, so that's what I'm going to drill into now. Uh, so what's generally uh, quite good about it is that the uh, the UI is far better than it was um, and it's much easier for the team at ProBrand to configure this so that you're um, maximizing costs. So we can schedule it in a few ways and perhaps I'll dig into that after the kind of presentation wraps up and we get to questions. But basically there's options for start and sign up where uh, if we take that N-series VM, I keep talking about um, if you have Craig, Sally and Tim and they're the three power users, the people that are doing graphic design, you can have it so that that um, that session host only springs to life when one of those three authenticates and logs in through Active Directory. That's one of the ways that we can do it, but there are others. 
which is really cool. So yeah, UI is way more accessible. Um, and there is what they call an extensive partners ecosystem. Uh, like I touched on in the comparison slide, if you do want to bring Citrix or VMware or something to the party, uh, you can do. Um, and the way I want to maybe uh, explain this better is I want to compare it to RDS as a traditional model. So general challenges with RDS, let's get it out of the way. Um, might say one thing with Microsoft, their marketing is always really strong, right? But the, the reality was RDS, um, I don't want to sound too harsh, but I'm not sure it ever really uh, blossomed into quite what was being um, envisaged. Uh, maybe that's the fairest way to put it. And often, if people wanted a half decent user experience, they would be bringing third party things into the mix like Citrix if they could afford it. Um, if they couldn't, and seeing as it's an enterprise product, a lot of people couldn't, you were sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place. You you maybe had a requirement for um, remote apps and remote working, but you had to contend with the latency issues. Perhaps the fact that it's not very well optimized for all sorts of devices. As soon as you're not using a desktop, it becomes a logistical headache. And if we look at the architecture for that here, I've just briefly talked about the device challenges here on the far left. But if we look at the center here, uh, the broker gateway and web access. Now, I appreciate we have a varied audience today. Some of you are technical and some aren't. So I'm not going to go too far into the weeds. But for the people that aren't technical, um, these are roles. We, we need this stuff to be done in order to um, facilitate the solution. And in order to do that, we'll need a VM to do each of these things. So assuming it's not a, a four person solution, we can't get away with doing all of this on one box. You know, people do try when it's a smaller user base, but generally we're going to need a virtual machine for each of these roles. And therefore we'll have compute costs for all of those servers and we will have Windows Server licensing costs. And so it's already starting to add up. Now, if we wanted to also have high availability or business continuity, you know, so that we um, we're reducing the chance of any appreciable period of outage that's going to cost us cash, um, we might double up have two VMs for each role. That's now six, six sets of compute, six sets of Windows licensing. It's getting quite costly. And that's all before we get to the, the far right of this, where we're looking at the actual user desktop pools, the VMs that are running those. And again, you're seeing a running theme here. Those servers will also have Windows Server licensing costs. You pay compute costs and then you pay server costs. So yeah, RDS was expensive. Um, and like I say, with things like the user latency, um, it's a challenge. I'll, I'll talk about myself, like internally, we um, I don't use it as much these days, but uh, about five years ago, we were using RDS in, in my organization. And and yeah, I experienced the user latency. It worked. You know, it wasn't it wasn't like it had a huge impact on our day to day productivity, but it was a total faff. Um, and sometimes there were there were challenges with it. So, yeah, that's me painting the picture, right? And if we compare that to the new model, first off, from a device point of view, it's fully uh, compatible with, the, with just about anything. If you've got a screen and a stable internet connection, you're good to go. So whether you're using Apple, uh, a phone, a tablet, uh, a desktop, um, you're going to be totally fine. You've also, your users have got the choice to access through browser or access uh, through the, the application. Um, I don't know, users are weird. I'll take it myself. Um, LinkedIn is one of those things where if I'm on my phone, I always go through browser. I don't have the app. I've never wanted to install it. It's done, I don't know, just for me, don't feel right, but I'll go to the browser maybe once a day or so. It's probably irrational. Most of you will be sat there like, why? But I'm sure if, if we reflect, we all probably have one or two apps where we do the same thing. For some reason, we, we just go through the browser experience. And if you've got users with that kind of preference, it's not going to be a problem. I hop back to here, the web access, the gateway, the broker, all of those things that would require servers with compute costs and Windows Server licensing costs. It's all part of the service here. It's all free of charge. It's uh, a PaaS offering that Microsoft are providing to you free of charge, which makes everything a lot cheaper. We're not paying those costs. Uh, and some of the security layers also built in. Uh, I touched on now. You know, Microsoft invests a billion dollars a year into their security platform uh, every year. So you're getting to uh, 
um, benefit from um, elements of that platform free of charge. Yeah, if you want to make sure all of the traffic, you know, from uh, from site and stuff secure, then you're going to need some kind of VPN firewall. I'm not saying everything, but from a platform perspective, you're covered. Yeah, once it's inside the castle, as it were. The the next big uh, thing of note is that the the user session hosts themselves. Um, we're com you know, comparing them to these over here. You don't have Windows Server licensing costs for these. Microsoft only charge you for the raw compute of the VMs. So further cost saving, you're not having Windows Server license costs on every box. So that's two big ways I've highlighted cost savings. From a user experience point of view, the latency is vastly improved. Um, the, without going into the weeds, basically Microsoft bought FS Logix a couple of years ago, and because of integrating that, latency is better. If I was just talking techy to techy, I'd have to, you know, add more detail there. But that's basically, uh, in a nutshell, why it's better. Uh, Microsoft were very um, bold with that statement um, with the marketing. I mean, during the lockdown, I did a webinar with a few hundred people on, and that was one of the things I cited. And at the time, uh, not that many people had used it. But since then, we've never had an end user turn around and go, oh, you know, you told us that the end user experience would be better than RDS and it's not. I'm not telling you it's perfect, but it, it's a vast improvement. So if you are using that and feeling the pain, that could be another reason to look at this. There's a, a third substantial cost saving where. If you have the right licensing and I'll get to that in a minute it actually negates the need for RDS cows, which is massive. And we'll look at that properly in a moment. But generally, you're getting a full Windows 10 or 11 uh, user experience. It's optimized for that. Uh, you can run it without Windows 10 or 11. You can, get, you can get a VDA license if you've got users that either aren't or don't want to use either of those OSs, but it's optimized for those. And Microsoft 365 as well. Great opportunity to migrate existing RDS. Um, so whether you've got whether you're running that on hardware and you're sweating those assets and maybe looking at pouncing into the cloud, that could be a good fit. Or perhaps if you're running RDS in Azure, this should be hand over fist more economical for you as a business. Uh, and what's quite neat about it is um, it it just helps you have a new perimeter. Um, I, I suppose the challenge with remote workers and stuff, we don't really have like a, a local network we can ring fence in the same way anymore. But if we if we've onboarded all those user devices, whether they are personal devices or uh, corporate, because to an extent that becomes immaterial, if we're using Endpoint Manager and Intune and Active Directory appropriately, we can still um, monitor and manage those devices. We can uh, set up conditional access on user files, um, uh, single sign on and all that jazz. We, we can do those things so we can make sure we've got our governance in hand. Um, we've got robust authentication authorization stuff in. in I mean, um, I think like Mark touched on this um, last uh, last week with the um, the numbers and um, how there's, there's sort of continued pressure to make sure that the level of MFA we're um, re requiring our users have is keeping up with with kind of recommendations and standards. And therefore, if you're using a solution like this, you can enforce that from the top down. Which is really cool. No, I'll talk about this briefly, like I mentioned how it's extensible, you can bring third parties to the mix, but if I'm honest, I would say 99% of the deployments I've worked on, like in the UK for AVD, have been vanilla. Um, it's it's so much more complete as a user experience than RDS ever was that most people don't feel the need to bring a third party in, which is great for you because if you're running RDS with one, that's in meet that's like an additional cost saving. Not only is AVD pound for pound more economical than uh, RDS was, but if you can get rid of your Citrix licensing, hell, that's even better. And yeah, here you go. I wonder how much this lot paid uh, to, to have that there. But look, yeah, OK, you can bring your thin clients, your Chromebooks and whatnot to use. And some of you will have user um, requirements where it makes sense to have those thin clients. But there is the opportunity here um, to not use them anymore. You don't have to buy 300 Chromebooks every four years anymore. Um, you know, I think I'd probably say there's a roughly 50-50 split of the opt we've engaged on 
Um, there sometimes is either a preference or a need to keep those devices for users. And so they keep them, but they use this for the remote working or some of the applications. But there's a fair number of organizations that have just stopped using them. Just like some people have, you know, stopped, you know, they, they don't use offices anymore. Some people, some people have done the same with those thin clients. So it could be something for you to reflect on. You may well have a reason why you need to keep them though. Now, if we look at licensing, um, really uh, you'll see the stars next to the business premium. Um, this is a bit of a busy slide, but that's where your attention should be. If I generalize, um, I know a lot of um, uh, programs customers are using the business standard license, which is a solid 365 offering. Uh, some of you have been uh, dabbling with the EMS feature set, you know, enterprise mobility. So in tune and Active Directory and stuff, your users since then. So some of you will added, have added that as an add-on, but some of you will have up so um, kind of kind of upgraded from business standard to business premium. And that really is the license you want to settle on, I think, for this. I mentioned earlier how if you're licensed appropriately, you don't need RDS cows. Now, people that aren't familiar, RDS cows, well, I sound cynical, but whatever, it's like a Monday morning. Um, I guess it's a Microsoft tax, really. Um, cows don't have any functionality. It's just for Microsoft audits, but you have to pay for them. Um, I'm sure they would uh, describe them differently, but that's the way I see it. Um, you're now, uh, basically, you have an opportunity to reinvest that money. Uh, if I look at Spla, there you go. It's probably a word none of you have heard for a few years, but Spla, right, the hosted... Uh, Opportunities for, um, yeah, the SPLA program anyway is something I want to briefly talk about because on SPLA you could buy RDS monthly, whereas if you buy it through most Microsoft options, it's annual or three year. So we're going to look at SPLA. The cost is around five pounds a month, uh, RRP. So basically, what you're doing is you're reinvesting that five pounds a month you had to spend on cows that didn't really give you anything. It just meant that you wouldn't get fined in an audit. <laughs> you're reinvesting that fiver into a more feature rich license. You're going from business standard to business premium. With that, you're getting your Intune for device management, your AVD for your, sorry, your active directory rather, for your um, tenancy and policy um, options. And you're also getting a Windows 10 slash 11 operating system on a monthly price. And so yeah, you're basically reinvesting the safe, same five pounds into a more feature rich license. So it feels like a no brainer. Now, you might have a number of users that need a slightly more like a bigger plan. Maybe they are those three or four people in every organization that need a 100 gig mailbox because reasons. Well, OK, they need the plan two version of Exchange. That would bring them then to Microsoft 365 E3, which is on that top bullet point there. I'm not sure. I'm trying to think of a scenario where you jump to E5, but yeah, your E3 might be your other license you'd look at other than premium. Uh, if you do have users that aren't using a Windows operating system, then they would look at that Windows 10 VDA license down there. Yeah, that's why they'd look at that. And the Windows 10 standalone licenses, that would be where it, they are the cheapest option, but it, it's also like, I'll call it the one of the bare, well, one of the cheapest, at least corporate. Uh, I've got some education licensing here, so I guess we're, I can't generalize. But yeah, Windows 10 standalone licenses are cheaper than business premium, but it only gives you the Windows 10 OS. So if you need Exchange and all those apps and stuff, it's you're better off just buying the business premium, I think. That's a little bit on licensing. What you can do, because there is still a server route, you can basically lift and shift your RDS and plonk it in AVD. You still benefit from some of those cost savings, but you would rather than be doing multi-session, you'd be doing server OS. So to talk about the difference with multi-session, which AVD allows, you can have a session host and you can have, I don't know, four, eight users on there, but they all have basically, what to them seems like a, 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 a separate, well, it is a separated desktop, but it's still multi-session. You're doing them all on one one desktop, which is really cool. Whereas really to do that with IDS, you would have to go server, but then you'd have a, um, ah, oh, the word's gone, damn it. Not perpetual, but persist. is it persistent? Not sure it's that either. But you know, when the environment um, is the same for all users, it's that. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're moving away from that. You can now have different uh, user desktops, different prof um, user profiles and icons and installed apps, but it's all still being done on one uh, virtual machine. What, for any given set of users? 
So from a cost point of view, we have our access costs, which is basically going to be our uh, in covered in our user license if we buy the right one, removes the need for RDS. And then for Azure costs, um, obviously this is you know the solution that Mark and the team and perhaps myself would get you know in the in the in the background would get involved to help kind of help you price this up and translate it into AVD. But your general um, shopping list of products will be your compute. So your uh, the the compute costs for your session hosts, there'll be storage costs, which could be general storage, but it also could be user profiles uh, when people authenticate through Active Directory. Uh, the, the recommendation is that you have 30 gigs of user profile storage per user. Um, historically, people used um, uh, they'd use file servers. You know, they'd, they'd make a file server in Azure and put a big data disk on it. But these days, every pretty much everybody uses Azure Files, which is a PaaS storage offering that's really decent that Microsoft do. So you just have 30 gigs times 12 users, 100 users, whatever for that. For networking, you might bring your own VPN or appliance, but if not, you might look at one of the Microsoft vanilla products. But yeah, we've obviously got to just think about connectivity. And similarly, identity, which I don't want to get bugged down in because it can get a bit depressing, but you're either going to have your on-premise domain controller, use AD Sync to get that working with Active Directory, sorry, Azure AD in the cloud, or you might have an Azure-based domain controller, like a virtual machine, or third option would be you'd look at Active Directory domain services, which is a PaaS domain controller option in Azure, but it only does domain services Sorry, yeah, not domain controller. It's a domain service. It only does domain services. If you need certificate services and stuff, it's not going to work. And this kind of helps me circle back to Windows 365, where you were thinking, but you told me I need enterprise. Why? Well, if you have a requirement for interaction with a fully fledged domain controller, you can't do that with Windows 365 because you can't have those separate Azure based workloads. Right. Um, so it also helps us secure those desktops. I've talked a bit about MEM already, Microsoft Endpoint Manager, MFA. We can have Defender for Endpoint stuff go, going on. Um, and you've got the Defender for Cloud stuff that's really cool. You, with Defender for Cloud, when that's running on your Azure Estate, you can get secure scores and stuff for your, um, for your website and stuff, which is quite cool because you can see where gaps are um, and your environment. Um, so there's just lots of options here, which is what I like. And to be honest, that's kind of uh, the end of my piece. I'm going to pass over to Mark now, and then um, we'll have some time for questions later on. So I hope that's been helpful, serving as a kind of a quick entry to it. Now Mark's going to touch on kind of how the team, uh, the good team at program can kind of help um, support you with uh, some of these changes. I appreciate there's quite a lot to dig through there. Cool. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. Can you hear and hear me okay and see my version of the slide? I can hear you. And Fantastic. Thank you very much. Actually. Thank you very much uh, for that overview of uh, Azure Virtual Desktop. Uh, I'm going to go into a few areas on how Probrand can assist in your journey if you're looking to uh, move to uh, or adopt Azure Virtual Desktop. Uh, and also a little bit on how ProBrain can help with billing, sizing, designing the environment. And then at the end of this, uh, we're going to have a bit of a Q&A session as well. So if you want to stick around for that, we'll have obviously the uh, the questions that you can ask at the end. You'll be able to submit your own questions uh, and perhaps find a little bit of interest in some of the questions that other people might be asking as well. So do stick around to the end and we'll get that, uh, that Q&A through. Um, ProBrain can assist in your um, cloud journey to uh, adopting and embracing as your virtual desktop there'll be a number of different things that you'll want to uh, take a look at in order to uh, map out that journey um, you're going to want to look at things like you know obviously the pricing um, as we said last week when we were looking at this obviously that a lot of the questions that people will have will be related to how much is this going to cost me it looks great but how much does it cost um, pricing estimates are something that we can help uh, put together for as your virtual desktop we've got access to some um, pretty pretty reasonably good um, pricing tools that can put together your pricing estimates for AVD uh, as Dave mentioned there obviously you're looking at a consumption based service you know you compare that to Windows 365 where it's a flat per user per month price as your virtual desktop is you know still based on a tariff it is as your after all we're looking at a consumption based um, pricing estimate here but as well as giving you that kind of overall price the pricing calculator tool do also give you a per user per uh, per month um, pricing estimate uh, out of the tool, which can be a useful output to have because 
particularly for growing organizations, one of the questions that people will usually have is, okay, if I take on a new member of staff, how much is it going to cost me to service the IT needs of that new member of staff? How much is it going to cost me to get them a new device? How much is it going to cost me in software licensing? And of course, if you're going down the route of AVD, it may be that you're not necessarily getting them a device. You may be saying, well, you can use your, your home PC, you can use a device that you already have, but for security purposes, we want to get you logged into an AVD desktop environment. You still want to know how much it's going to cost you to bring them on board and how much your costs are going to be. So we can give you that kind of per user per month pricing estimate so that you can see that side of it as well. Obviously, there's going to be a certain amount of design process that goes into this. Uh, spinning up an actual AVD desktop estate is relatively quick and easy to do. One of the advantages that you get here by adopting and embracing something like AVD is that you spend less time thinking so much about all of the servers that go around it. You know, Think about if you've ever had any experience of things like remote desktop services or other solutions from other vendors, Citrix, VMware, etc. There's a lot of what I sometimes refer to as support servers. You know, you, you've got brokers and session management servers and licensing servers and web front end servers and storefronts and whatever it's, it happens to be. With AVD, you don't you don't really have that. You don't have to worry about putting in a load of additional VMs just to broker access to the environment. That all sort of goes away and it's sort of taken care of by Microsoft, which means you can zero in on just managing the actual VMs that provide those desktop sessions all those streamed apps down to users. So there's going to be a certain amount of just designing that, setting that up. We have to think about what software is going to be available inside those desktop sessions. Similar to many other environments these days, the um, process of managing applications and managing the actual desktops can be separated so that you can keep the, the actual VMs that provide the desktops and the packages that provide the software as two separate entities and then update them separately from one another to help make your life a little bit easier. Easier. And of course, if different users have got you know different sets of applications that they need access to, you can just attach the relevant software to each desktop session as users log in. So there's different ways that we can provide access to the environment here and different ways that we can manage it. So there'll be a certain amount of design uh, to build in here. Then, of course, we can look at helping to execute with a pilot or proof of concept, usually a good idea because every environment has got different software, different software packages and figuring out how that looks and, and if there's any particular special arrangements that need to be put in place for the software is something that has to be you know uh, looked at for each individual application package you're going to want to spend a bit of time working with the software vendor to make sure that their software is going to be supported in the avd environment um, is it going to be supported for streaming if that's what you want to do uh, are there any particular processes for updating it is the software already provided in a package format that can simply be attached to AVD or will it need to be repackaged? There's going to be a certain amount of processes there. So we usually recommend starting with a pilot and POC. And also it helps to sort of check that we're getting all of the performance right here. Are users getting the experience that we need them to have? We have to start with the end user experience really and, and work our way backwards to the technology. So it's all about making sure that they're getting a good experience when they're logging in. Uh, and will that scale well? Usually that's not so hard to achieve when you're looking at AVD. Um, some of the uh, elements that you might have had to think about with an on-premises remote desktop solution, whether it be Citrix, Microsoft, VMware, you know, you've got to think about what's the underlying hardware and, and will that hardware provide the resources that I need to deliver uh, a decent level of performance and a decent user experience? when you're looking at AVD, there's not really a concern about the underlying hardware because it's Azure. It's a it's a big, huge data center. If you need more resources, you can have more resources. You don't need to worry about um, buying the right hardware. It's, it's just a case of picking the right VMs, picking the right uh, allocation of users to VMs and density to get that um, performance and that user experience that you need. And if you find that you need to switch to a uh, a larger VM size in Azure, or you need more VMs deployed, you don't need to worry about whether there's enough underlying resource from Microsoft, it's going to be there. You can just deploy the extra VMs or change the VM size as you need to. But nevertheless, a pilot and a POC is still a good idea to make sure that um, all of the design elements are shaken out and that you've got that user experience in place. As well as, of course, you're going to be thinking about once you've got the platform up and running, the ongoing services that you might want to align to this in the environment. 
um, ongoing support services to update and manage your software, uh, ongoing elements around backing up the environment. There's a certain amount of data and storage that is provisioned. Um, Dave mentioned, for example, things like FS logics for profile management. We want to make sure that that's protected. All of that needs to be uh, considered for things like backup, for example, to make sure that you, know, you don't lose any elements of that and that the user environment isn't undermined by any problems there. So these are some of the things that you'll want to align around that. Now, obviously, all of this is going to go into your Azure subscription. Um, when it comes to ProBrand, we can provide the uh, billing for that subscription on a simple monthly invoice. No need to reach for the company credit card. And we try to make it as easy as possible to keep track of your spend, um, whether it's servers or other resources that you're provisioning in Azure or AVD. You're going to want to know that you've got transparency and visibility on your spend. So we provide access to that through a simple uh, and easy to access monitoring dashboard where you can see at a glance uh, what you're spending on different elements of your Azure subscription. Um, signing up to get your billing done through ProBrand is pretty straightforward. We simply authorize ProBrand as a billing partner. ProBrand can then create your Azure plan um, or several. You can create as many subscriptions as needed. Any resources that you then allocate to that Azure subscription over in the Azure portal will then be billed through ProBrand via that monthly invoice. Uh, as mentioned, you get a, a reporting dashboard, so you're going to get an invoice coming through that's going to say Microsoft Azure with a number associated with it. Um, it's obviously going to be the case that you're going to want to know what's behind that. Now, you'll probably have a good I idea if you're in the IT department because you, you hopefully will have control over what resources are going into your Azure environment. But people will often want to have a breakdown, exactly what makes up each monthly bill, what services were behind that, how does that break down? And of course, if you do see any unusual costs or cost increases and you want to know where that came from, you're going to want to know that you've got transparency and that you can see what's going on. So in the reporting dashboard, you can pick a month, see the figure against that month, see the different components of that uh, monthly spend, all of the different virtual machines, storage, network, bandwidth, everything that made up that monthly bill will be broken down so that you can see what's going on. Uh, for anyone familiar with Power BI, you'll probably recognize that this is a Power BI dashboard and you'll know that there are all sorts of different ways to drill down into this information. So not only can you get the high level breakdown that you see here, but you can also drill down into this, export it if people want reports over in the accounting department, you can get all of that information available here and drill down in all sorts of different ways so that you've got that full billing transparency and additional alerting thresholds for billing. Obviously, there's a certain amount of alerting for billing that you can do inside Microsoft Azure, but our billing environment also provides its own uh, alert that can be sent to you. You can set your own custom threshold, and if it looks like that threshold is going to be breached, you can get an alert. Now, why would you want that as well as what you can get from Microsoft? Well, sometimes you might want uh, an additional um, a, an additional alert set up. Some people appreciate having that sort of belt and braces uh, solution in place that they just know that one way or another they're going to get an alert if billing is as higher than they expect so that they know about it first. Other times it may be the case that the IT department is getting alerts coming to them from Microsoft, um, but the accountancy department, they want their own alert that will come through to them as well. They want to know that things are uh, under control and that if there's any uh, additional spend going on that people know about it. So, you know, sometimes it can help to have that additional transparency, but just know that you can put that alert in place, that you've got that full knowledge that if there's any spend coming through, you know about it. It's not just the Azure spend, it's also your seat based licensing that can be provisioned through the uh, through this billing portal. Um, so Microsoft 365 licenses or individual components thereof, things like Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, Dynamics, uh, Power Platform licenses, even perpetual licenses like Windows Server, for example, can be licensed through this billing environment. So, of course, as we're talking about AVD here, as was noted by Dave, there's a bunch of different licenses that provide the rights to access the AVD environment. And so you're going to want to have those 365 licenses. I think it was interesting to see there that um, obviously things like Business Premium uh, include those access rights, but also the frontline worker plan F3, including the access rights as well. You know, you get environments where if you've got frontline workers who don't really sit at a desk, they are field-based workers, and most of the time they might be accessing 
a mailbox or maybe teams through a mobile device but every once in a while they need to access a, a piece of software it could be that you stream that software to them from avd to whatever device they happen to have and the fact that they are a, a frontline worker and that you don't have to uplift them to a full business premium or a full enterprise license you can keep them on that frontline worker plan um, which is relatively low cost and still have access to that avd environment it could be very useful for many customers um, so very, very worthwhile keeping that in mind. Um, the CSP licensing portal that we provide does offer a full catalogue of Microsoft Cloud services, uh, and it's linked to Microsoft's back end and your tenancy, which means that when you want to provision licenses, it's very, very fast to get those licenses provisioned and get them available in your portal for you to assign to users very, very quickly. Um, so that's something that we can do in a matter of minutes. Um, you can mix and match monthly and annual licenses in your tenancy. Obviously, these days you can decide whether or not you're paying for licenses uh, monthly, whether you're paying them annually, whether you're paying annually but with a monthly bill. You, you've got a few choices available. You can mix and match. So if you've got seasonal workers, for example, and you want to just uh, assign a few licenses for a few months while they're on staff and then spin them down afterwards, you can mix and match so that you can have those monthly licenses alongside the more affordable annual ones in your tenancy. Um, as mentioned, perpetual licenses are available too. So if you need to, I don't know, license SQL Server, for example, you can do that through the portal. Uh, we provide self-service access to the portal as well for rapid setup anytime. So the choice is yours. Um, if you'd like to um, work with your account manager whenever you need new licenses assigned to your tenants we can do that but we can also provide you self-service access to the portal too so that you can just pick the products you need assign them to your tenancy change quantities for existing line items um, and as mentioned here because this is linked to your tenancy it means that if you sign in add some new licenses and then hop over to your uh, microsoft admin portal the new licenses will be there there's no need to wait for an order to clear or anything like that or for a, an account manager to process that for you you can just do this yourself and it will happen within a matter of minutes those new licenses will just be available for you to use and assign to users um, billing reports in the portal we saw the um, azure dashboard there but we also provide the billing reports of course for your seat based services so you can go in have a look at any given month and see what the licensing breakdown looks like and there's no extra cost for this service and when we see no, when we say no extra cost, we mean it. There's no hidden costs. We don't add our license costs. There's no additional cost for using this licensing portal, having your billing through here, having all of those reports, having the alerts. It's all just part of that uh, part of that service that we offer for no extra cost. That brings me to the end of the slide deck here. Um, so I think now this is where we're going to be opening up the floor for uh, Q and A. So uh, Nicole, back to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so, so thank you very much um, to our, our webinar guests. I hope the presentation gave you some insight into how to introduce and implement AVD for your hybrid workforce. So yes, we'll go to uh, our Q&A session. And um, Lindsay, do we have any questions? Hi there. Yes, if anyone has any questions, uh, any more questions, please do pop them in the Q&A um, section that you should see at the top of your screen. Um, we have had one come in. Um, one of our attendees is wanting to know um, what would be an ideal customer size for um, for Azure Virtual Desktop? Yeah, OK, great question. So the main thing we have to remember with APD is there is an element of economy of scale. So if you have a particularly, um, uh, you know, workforce on the smaller end, let's say 5, 10, 15 users, that's where something like Windows 365 might look like a better fit because like, Per, the per user cost is going to be in its favor, I think. Um, but we've we've seen plenty of deployments kind of really from 10 users up. But I think really the value starts to shine when it's 20 plus, which many of you will be. But I think that's how I would if I had to generalize. But of course, that, it, the devil's always in the details. If we had like the CAD workers I keep talking about, you, you think I was sponsored by some architecture firm. But in that sort of scenario, maybe five or six users, it's still going to be more cost effective than what they were using previously, especially with the uh, opportunities to schedule those VMs and stuff. So, yeah, that's that's my general thoughts on that. Um, um, if you're sort of 20 users, go on, Mark, you're about to add something. 
No, no, no. I'll, I'll, if you if you if you want to keep going, yeah, I'll, no, that was, I'll, that was it uh, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I was just going to say we, we've we, we've also seen customers of a variety of sizes. I mean, a customer that we're we're talking to at the moment uh, is um, growing through acquisition. They they're they're acquiring quite a few different customers, and it and it's interesting because it's um, proving to be good value um, from from all of the calculations we're doing with them on a couple of different areas. I mean, firstly, it's uh, it's not just the economy of scale, as you say, but it's also the fact that it, it's making it very, very rapid for them to get those users in the acquired business onboarded into their IT very, very quickly. All of the software, all of the applications, everything that they need to then very quickly provide to that acquired business. It's just a case of, well, log into AVD and all of the software you need will just be there. So it, it makes it very easy and quick for the, for you to get them onboarded. But again, just to sort of, I, I guess, touch upon that point that you, you, you can still get a kind of per user per month price. Um, and the pricing calculators make it very easy to sort of figure that out and say, this is how much it's going to cost. You know, you, you can look at the the overall price, but you can also see the breakdown and say, well, all of the services, if you divide that by the number of users, it's going to look like this. But yeah, there is certainly an economy of scale there. Any Great, other questions you. that have uh, come through, Lindsay? Um, there was one more um, around how is automation handled um, when it comes to, you know, out of hours? OK, so there's there's a couple of different options. I, I mentioned earlier the then there are more, but the first one I mentioned was um, like start on connects. So you can have it where you have named users where um, we might have some general pools for like our D-series VMs and then our power users, um, Tim, John and Sam, whenever they log in. Um, uh, as, if, if none of those three have logged in, um, maybe they're going to a morning meeting or I don't know, they're notoriously late to the office every morning or something or whatever. Um, it's not going to spring to life until they appear. So that's one way to do it. Another way is using the native UI because it used to have to be with PowerShell and stuff. That's what Mark and the team would have to resort to um, historically. But these days, the uh, the native UI is much better and you can actually schedule snoozing of those session hosts. So you can have it so that they like turn on and off. So you might say, well, we're pretty much exclusively nine to five. We've got um, one of those cultures like um, there's usually always one, isn't there, that's on at like eight in the evening but there are some companies that tell me no 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 once it's 5 p.m zero work policy so if that's you fair play to you um and that could be an opportunity where you just have it running nine to five so that's like uh so so you, if we had something running 24 7 that's about 730 hours in an average month but it would be about 220 if you were nine to five so you've cut those costs by two thirds so that's the second general way to do it. It can get more complicated. There are more nuanced options, but they're your general, like, like general approaches. One is we schedule it on a sort of kind of hourly rate. The other is start on connect. Now, if you've got shift workers and stuff, then scheduling probably is not going to work as well as maybe start on connect. But um, they're the general options. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and, and I guess just to briefly add to that, again, yeah. when we're doing the pricing and the, the calculations around this, again, the pricing tool takes into account kind of like peak versus off peak um, so that we can make that determination of how that affects the actual monthly price. So we're not over egging it. We can sort of show you exactly what the differences are in that regard. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think we've got one more question. Um, do you see a trend of existing Citrix based users moving away and adopting a full Azure virtual desktop? We have over 50% of our users and it works well if they don't need Teams. Unfortunately, they need Teams video now. OK, cool. So I th that's an interesting one. There's two parts to that. So first part is, yes, we have seen um, quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of customers have moved to AVD and abandoned the Citrix piece. Not all. We've had some that have had both on top. So that's the first half is a yes. Second half is interesting. You touch on the video, and I, I think if I answered the question, I think you were saying that you're having the challenges with video running in Citrix. And for for sake of transparency, um, there is there are similar challenges 
with Microsoft, you're seeing it where people will run like 95% of everything through AVD, and then they might do the um, Teams video through browser as a workaround. It's not perfect, but Microsoft know that that's the like almost not the Achilles heel. That makes it sound like it's a, a damning problem, but it's something that needs improving. And it, I can say, uh, give you some qualitative, not quantitative feedback. Um, if I look at a year ago, the amount of support tickets that would be that would arise around Teams video issues in AVD to now, it's much less. That there, there has been improvements, but I still think there's a way to go. Um, but if I think further back, um, things like the metadata used to be exclusively out of the states, which is such a deal breaker for a lot of UK and kind of Euro based businesses. And they've they've dealt with that. And I think the next the next hurdle they're halfway over, but they need to do a bit more work on is, yeah, with Teams video. Um, there are workarounds and things that, that people are using um, and what you can do. Microsoft have like a oh, what's the word? like an updates page for, for AVD and services where you can actually vote for what feature you want next. So you could always go there and add your voice. But yeah, uh, predictably, that's the most commonly voted for thing to improve. So in your scenario, if I did understand that correctly, you're having challenges with Citrix. To be honest, you would probably, I'm not saying it would be perfect if you move to AVD now. And you may find that it might be an op where you might um, wait a little bit of time for Microsoft to keep working on it. Um, but equally, there are a lot of people that are doing everything through AVD bar the Teams video. Um, and there's a few different ways to do that, but that's how they're, they're effectively getting around it. They're seeing enough general improvements and cost saving by abandoning the Citrix that they've made that move. So trying to give you an honest answer there. A lot of people have dropped the Citrix and moved to AVD, but that tends to be the one thing that, that people have to contend with as well. So yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Is there anything you wanted to add, Mark? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I was just just going to add that regarding Teams on AVD, Microsoft have got a, a dedicated page on the uh, doc site or Microsoft Learn site as it now is um, with information about some of the requirements and restrictions of using Teams, not just in AVD, but in any VDI or remote desktop environments, including some information on the best way to deploy the Teams client in those kind of environments and some of the optimizations and considerations that you can do just to try and uh, get the best out of it. So I've added the link to that page Page as a response to the question. So hopefully you'll be able to see that. Um, and it's it's potentially useful just to have a read of that page because it generally will also get updated as Microsoft make changes and updates to the Teams client with features that may be a restriction in uh, AVD environments or other VDI solutions. But these are the sort of areas where you know, those two teams are a little bit in lockstep. The teams very much gets a lot of proactive development because it's it's something that Microsoft are quite focused on. AVD also gets a lot of proactive development. So in that regard, both do move forward quite a lot. And there are probably fewer restrictions or limitations with um, running teams on AVD today than would have been the case, say, 12 months ago. So these things tend to improve and get better over time because they're both being proactively developed. And of course, it's cloud, so we don't have to, you know, wait two, three years for the next version. As they make these improvements, they just become available. Yeah, love it. Good point. Great, thank you. I think that's us for questions. OK, great. I'll um, I'll just share the um, the feedback form with everyone. The link's actually in the chat. Um, not too many questions on here, just, um, you know, what you found, um, you know, of most interest. Um, would you recommend us again? And also just to let you know that um, we're offering all attending delegates the opportunity to claim their free cloud review, proof of concept, or £1,200 worth of Azure consumption. Conditions do apply there. Um, but if you're interested in that, please um, add your details here and submit the form and we'll, we'll pick up on that. So thank you very much. Um, all really that, that, that's left for me to say is we've, we've finished bang on time. <laughs> well done, everybody. Um, thank you to our, to our speakers, Mark and Dave. Um, we now draw to a close, so thank you very much for attending. We'll be sharing the recording of the webinar uh, with everyone, um, either later today or tomorrow. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great. See you on the next one. Thanks. Bye-bye.